Hey, welcome to the Relentless Positivity Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Martin. And third grade, Steph Katsavi, she announced that she was going to be an author when she grew up. And after graduating law school and serving as a strategic communications consultant, she decided it was time to live up to the third grade self. And now she's living her dream. Steph, thanks for coming on the show. It's so great to be here, Joe. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's exciting. Not many third graders know what they're going to do. So that's, they usually have some wild ideas. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and I think for third grade me, I would not never predicted that I actually would have followed through on what I guessed for myself as a good profession, but it's nice to dream, right? That's right. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. So we'll, we'll kind of bring it back because I kind of mentioned some of it. What, what, what was your journey to becoming a published author? Well, I think the very short answer is a very, very roundabout way. But um, as you mentioned, in third grade, I had in my mind that I wanted to do something involving writing and I wanted to be an author, but I'm also a very practical person. And as I got older and I realized you have to pay bills, uh, I realized I couldn't just go from, you know, college and writing. Uh, I was a pre-law and English major. I knew I couldn't just go out into the world and be like, here is a book that I'm about to write. So uh, I went to law school instead. And for me, that was a really amazing experience just in testing yourself. And it was a tough, tough three years being in school, very rigorous. And after that, when I passed the bar exams, I said, not, not interested in law. But I do want to do something involving writing and the closest that I came was in corporate communications and strategic communications and so I spent a long time uh, at a great company called Deloitte doing uh, corporate communications and being a professional writer and that sort of helped hone my understanding of how to write for people and really have them receive the message that you are trying to put out there and so you know I was a speechwriter for a corporate executive for many many years and having him say what I thought would be an amazing message or impactful message. Uh, sometimes I didn't always hit the mark, but a lot of times I did. And uh, then when it was his time to retire, I thought this might be a good time for me to retire and use the knowledge that I've acquired all over, all these years to write into my own creative uh, work. And it took a childhood and six and a half years to get my first book out. But um, now I've, I've got my second book out and Gets, I get to live my third grade self stream. So, uh, you know, it all comes for us full circle in a way. That's awesome. And it, I mean, people don't know about this. There's a lot of writing going on in law school, isn't there? Yeah, that's true. And it's a really interesting, you have to be really focused and really strategic and smart and words matter. I think that was one of the biggest lessons I learned in law school is that words really matter. And that made me pay attention to a lot of what I was writing in business. And then later as I write for children, and I have two boys of my own and they're my toughest critics, to be perfectly honest. You know, if it doesn't capture their interest, then, you know, that you haven't done your job as a writer. So, you know, I have to really be careful uh, when you write for kids, especially you've got to keep a plot that's moving. And me, I have a great sense of humor, I'd like to think. So a lot of my writing tries to inject humor and funny things that kids will find appealing. And often it's gross or embarrassing, but I realize that's kind of what kids like. So. Uh, uh, 47, your audience. Man, I'm, I'm 47 i'm pretty uh that's pretty much my target mark i'm gross stuff i'm in all that. <laughs> it's the same in my household so i i feel like i'm uniquely positioned to know what will be a uh, a good uh story and what might fail so you know I, i'm glad that i can road test it with my home audience too <laughs> that's awesome yeah he's got to work at home first so uh so why children you could have probably wrote a different you you know you could have gone corporate you could have gone many different ways why children's mm -hmm. books you know, I, I thought about this question and I think I keep coming back to the fact that, you know, in my mind, I think I'm still a 13 year old. Um, I don't look like a 13 year old, but in my head, I think I have the spirit and mentality of a 13 year old. So, you know, I also think that some of it goes back to I have some unfinished business from my own childhood that I use my writing to help resolve. And the hope really is that the issues that I experienced as a child and even as, a, as an adult um, and the lessons that I've learned, I can put into a story that will really grab people's attention and show them either they're not alone in their experiences and their feelings or give them a window into a world of something that they may not have experienced in their lives. And for me, it's also a chance to rewrite history in the way I wish it could have turned out. Uh, the sidebar is my first book called Her Camp was about a young girl going to sleepaway camp for the first time and sort of grappling with her independence. and. I also went to sleepaway camp when I was a kid and, and didn't love it candidly. I was horribly homesick and I never went back to sleepaway camp after that. And I think writing a book about that experience where, spoiler alert, it has a happy ending, 
um, that was my chance to redo what I wish I had done if, if I had, had had a second chance at reliving that childhood experience. Oh, that's awesome. Cause they say you're, you're most qualified to help the person you used to be. Right. So someone that some kid out there that maybe they're like, Oh, well, I'm never going back to sleep away camp. Like, like, Oh, maybe, maybe there's, a, maybe it could be better next time. Yeah. So. And I, I think the, the big message that I put into a lot of my work is that, you know, inner courage and strength is something that you often don't realize you have until it's tested. And uh, at the time I didn't realize until I went home that, you know what, if I had just tried a little harder or, gone a little bit out of my comfort zone, I would have had a completely different experience. And so, you know, this is hopefully what I can put onto a page that will help kids appreciate and understand that they also have this amazing superpower if they can just tap into it. And frankly, that's probably the hardest thing to do at any age, but, you know, literature has got an amazing way to uh, share important messages in a way that's uh, something that kids can understand, however it is that they're experiencing that situation. Oh, that's a great message right there. So uh, who were your kind of influences, authors that you read growing up and who influenced your work? Um, you know, I was a huge reader as a child. I still am as a grown up. Um, and, you know, I'll say because it's the summertime when we're recording this. But when I was a kid at uh, Grinnell Library, where I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, they had a summer reading contest. And I routinely was the winner of the summer reading contest. Oh. Who could read the most books? Um, but I think when I was picking books out, uh, my favorite authors probably were Judy Bloom because of her relatable characters and the, the fun voice that she wrote in where you felt like you were part of the action. Uh, and, you know, some of those characters are so memorable because they're a little off the wall or, you know, they're just like you or me. Uh, and so, you know, I love the relatability of her work. I also love Ramona Quimby, uh, Beverly Cleary series where there's quirky characters that you probably know in your everyday life and uh you know just fun to see what adventures and misadventures they, misadventures they go through and also i think there's a book that i was reading when i was starting to become a middle grade writer and i wanted to understand what was the kind of language i should be using um what types of stories are kids interested in at this age group just so i could be more familiar and i found uh, the penderwick series gene birdsall was great because it had this timeless nature where you didn't know what time the story took place, but it had this really classic feel. And so I try and put that into my work where you don't know it could be 1984, 2004, 2024. So, you know, I try and put all that in and hopefully I'm successful, at least to some extent, but uh, we'll, we'll see as time goes on. Hey, people are people no matter what age, right? So they always kind right. of some themes over the years. So exactly. So I'll kind of give to how writing actually works is kind of a selfish question on my part. I'm curious how other authors do it. So what's a typical writing day look like for you? Are there rituals you have, all these different things? How does it go about? What do the nuts and bolts look like? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that I love a good schedule, but uh, as a writer, uh, you know, or even in any business profession uh, or any profession, schedules are always changing and you know depending on the day it will be a different type of schedule uh, you know for social media you have to plan in advance so i've got different types of days where it's social media prep whether it's book prep or editing and so i always start the day sitting at my desk with a cup of coffee and, and i'll be honest it's probably decaf but i'm a little bit of a lightweight <laughs> but i really like the warmth and sweetness of this coffee, it's probably basically sugar water, but um, it's a way for me to just kind of get settled into my chair and my thinking space and get all the uh, the ways that I get distracted out of my mind and, you know, clean up the inbox or read the news. And then once I finish my coffee, it's time to get to work. And so whatever that task of the day is, um, you know, it gets time to focus and then you know, for the most part, I write or do the work until I am not finding that the creative juices are flowing as smoothly. It's probably going to be like lunchtime by then. Um, but yeah, I think the most important message I would say for me as a writer is creating a schedule, whether it's changing it from week to week, whether it's changing it from day to day, or even if it's hour to hour, and then really holding yourself to it uh, and making sure that you complete the things that will make you feel proud of the work you've done. Um, coming from a corporate environment and then going to being an author, there's nobody saying you have to be in work at eight and you're done by, you know, six o'clock or whatever. But uh, I treated it like that. I kind of treated it as this is my job. And even if there's no uh, 
you know, year end review, I still think that in my mind, I need to keep myself in check. And so being disciplined was probably the greatest challenge when I started being a writer. But now I guess it's just second nature in a way because that's, that's how I'm built. That's incredibly hard. It's a very disciplined. It takes a lot of discipline. Have you ever read the book, uh, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? No, but I think I might have to write that down and check it out. Tell me about it. It's a really good book. So he just talks about the muse, how you tap into the muse, and it's just Mm -hmm. grinding. It's staying on schedule, sitting in front of that computer. You don't want to be there. There's a thousand other places you want to be, but you keep pounding away. And eventually the story comes out, right? But it's just that discipline to sit down at that computer when you want to do a thousand other things Mm -hmm. and still still doing the work. I know. Well, the the danger, you know, for being an author who works from an office in her house is there's also laundry that one could do. (laughs) But that's also it could be an incentive. Like if I get this done, then I could. It sounds like folding the laundry is not really a reward. But if you need a break, well, well, that's a great way to clear your mind for a few minutes and then whatever else you need to get done. I I now regret saying that laundry is a reward for doing work, but (laughs) Yeah. Maybe I'll have to think of it that way the next time I have a uh, wash to do. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. Like any anything other than sitting at this computer sometimes. Like right. I, I was so excited to take out the trash earlier today. I was watching. <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> I was looking for anything other than sitting in front of this. That's thing. Right. I get Thank it. I get it. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have lame people hang out, right? That's good. Right. It's, that's true. It's so true. So when you're creating these characters, uh, how do you go? Is there a system you use to create this character? How do you go about creating these characters? Well, I think there's that saying, you write what you know. And, and for me, I like to pull on my experiences from people that I've known when I was a child, uh, people that I know as an adult. And I, I guess I would say I draw a composite so as not to cause any problems with anybody that may or may not resemble a character. <laughs> But um, I think for me, it's thinking about who was an interesting figure in my life. What was their purpose? You know, why why did I run into them and what experiences did they have or what lessons did I learn from them or what did I like or not like about them? And and so I sort of put that into a character um, in my books. It's usually girls that have something really that pops out at you is what their, you know, their big trait is like uh, one of the best friend characters of the main character in my book is kind of prickly, but really smart and she's got a heart of gold. And then there's kind of that snooty person that was another character, the happy go lucky. I mean, it's like sort of those common character traits that you see throughout literature, but, you know, certainly mapped to my own humor and imagination. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of fun in creating these characters because I think you've probably seen similar people in your own experiences in your own life and and here they are on a page and and for kids and even adults to read it i think that adds to the relatability of the work that i'm trying to do well, you've done a great job I mean, it's so vivid and they're relatable that's the thing you, you, when i read a book i want to see myself in in the mm-hmm. story right and you do a great right. job writing that it's not these people that are you know superheroes or something like that that i can never be like oh i could be that kid and i can be right. a part of the story i get immersed in the story so that's cool that you do that um, you mentioned it earlier. Why, why is humor so important for you to inject into your stories? I think, um, and, and I, I wish I thought of a elo- more eloquent way to say this, but I think humor is one of the greatest ways to get messages across in a way that's not imposing it on you, but you can embrace it in a way that it, it feels honest and genuine to you. And so I'm a, a person that loves to make a joke. I often make fun of myself in a positive way because I think it's a little disarming when you can laugh at yourself about something silly Um, and it's just an easier way for me to sort of communicate with people because I think we all like to laugh and as a speechwriter I knew like the audience was going to be really engaged if they could understand what you're trying to say but also be involved in that story and laughing and clapping I think are the best examples and very rarely do you clap when you read a book, but you know more often than not, you, you'll laugh if there's something that that's you know strikes a nerve, and so that's kind of the goal of why I like to put humor in. And, and again, plus you know with kids, humor is what's really in a very appealing element to life for them. You know, I think laughter often really is the best medicine, and so that's my hope when I put it into my books. Hey, life is too short. We need to laugh more often, right? We don't need to. I agree. If you can't find something to laugh about, then you're not looking hard enough. 
That's it. Especially when there's like some, it helps break up like some awkward adolescent stuff the kids are going through and things like that. You can get yeah. humor in there. Man, it breaks the tension a little bit. Oh my gosh. If I showed you a picture of myself when I was 13, like bad hair, I think I had really big glasses, may or may not have had braces at the time, but like I laugh at that picture of myself because I was like, oof, I walked around not realizing there was, you know, I guess my kids call it glamming up, but there's so much glamming up I could have been doing. And <laughs> it's funny to look back on that because what do I know? I mean, as a kid, that's that was what I that's what I looked like. But, you know, it's fun to be able to look back and say, yep, could have could have changed the glasses or the hair around or done something different with the outfit. But it makes for a good story now. <laughs> I, uh you're talking to a ginger. I know awkward. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've got great coloring. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah. I'm, and I got the, I got the ginger thing, but if you're a ginger, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's awkward. Growing <laughs> up. It's the only one. You're always pale. It's awkward. It's bad times, but yeah, Hey, that's, that's why we're both funny though. Nowadays. Right. I think so. I think, you know, it's a good way for people to feel like, yeah, I can relate to this person, even though we're not exactly the same, but this person, you know, in your case, you're an open, genuine, kind, funny person. And I like that. Let's be friends. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it. So I know I know they're probably like your kids and you don't have a you can't really choose a favorite, but if you had to choose a favorite of all your character, who's who's the favorite? Oh man. You know, I would I would put it into categories. I would say um the main character from both of my books, her name is Laura and her nickname is Noodle Newman. I would say I'll pick her as my favorite character because she probably is the closest to resemble me. So uh, I can easily write about her for a gazillion books, probably, but finding a good plot line will be obviously the determining factor. But she's a really fun one to write for because, you know, I know exactly what I would do in a situation, but it might not be the choice that I want that character to make. So I can either turn it serious, I can turn it funny, I can make it awkward, I can do, you know, whatever misadventure might be interesting to the story. So it's fun to sort of play around and, and try out different hats because it's a it's a person that I'm really comfortable with. On the other hand, there are some characters that I have in my book that are just so out in left field that it's really just like writing a comedy show for them because you're just like, this would be something I could never ever do, but this character for sure would do it. And so, you know, it's fun to just sort of try on a different person entirely and, and just imagine how they would react and respond. And so you know, I have a bunch of characters that I think would fall into that bucket of fun to write for could never be me. But yeah, I'll go back to um, my my own doppelganger in uh, fiction form as, as the fun one. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. If I had more time to think about all the things that I would want to say is a great response, I could come back and give you a different one, probably. But I'm going to go back with original thinking on this one. Oh, that, that was a great answer. First answer. Always stick with your first answer. That was a good one. You're right. You're right. <laughs> noodles it in. Go with noodles. Uh, I know it's got to be super rewarding engaging with the younger readers. How, how do you go about that? Well, I'm really lucky, first off, because my sons are both in the target audience of who I write for. So I get to see their friends and the people that are in their classes. And I get to really check out whether I'm on target with the characters and stories that I write or whether I need to scale it back or put more in. Uh, so it's fun to talk to my, my son's friends and, and just get some insights into their world. And then also I, I was really fortunate enough to do some author visits at some schools in the area where I live. And I can't even convey how amazing it was to visit kids and just see their genuine interest and their enthusiasm in my work. Yes, that was really flattering and really humbling, but also just in learning and experiencing the world through the eyes of, of being a young person. And it was just, it's so fantastic to talk to them and, and hear what they're interested in. I remember one question. Uh, when they were asking me a Q&A, they're like, do you know J.K. Rowling? And I was like, of all the questions you could write an author, ask an author, that's an interesting one. But then I thought for a second, I'm like, clearly this is her favorite author. And so, you know, I, I answered in a way that said, I've never met her, but she's an amazing writer. And, you know, she sends so many wonderful things with the, the stories that she writ she's written. And that satisfied this young girl. And I was just like, you know what, you want to hear uh, things that are of interest to you and, and the more you can re relate and respond to, to your audience, the better I think not only you'll be received in your work, but also in, in my case as 
the author that was visiting. And so it's just a really fun experience to connect with people because so much about writing for kids is about creating connections, not just in the stories that you tell, but when you actually get to meet your readers to help, you know, make what you put on a page more of a reality for them. So it's just a really fun experience when you get to meet the folks that, that are actually reading your work. Uh, I can't imagine because I, I just went and, you know, I'll go to the schools every round, just read books. I didn't even write them. I'm not even involved. Mm -hmm. I'm just reading. And they're so enthusiastic and they're having so yeah. much fun. They're on, they're on the edge of their seat or these are sitting on the ground. But I mean, they're yeah. just so awesome to see little kids involved and engaged in reading. It, it gets me excited. Yeah. And you think about like, this is the future of, of you know, the world is, are these kids that are coming up because, you know, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm not too old, but I'm not that young. And so, you know, seeing the next generation and, and what their passions are, it's just phenomenal. And, you know, it's, it was really a good sort of check for me to, to you think about what it is I want to write about and, and really be more conscious of how I can be impactful in a positive way. And that was, you know, meeting kids is such a great reminder of how to really think about your audience and what you really want to do to help elevate them. And that was the really, really fun experiences meeting kids. I love it. I love seeing them. They thought I was a celebrity of like the grandest proportions. And, <laughs> and so it was like, well, you know, I think I'm, I'm, you know, important in a way, but certainly not at the level of, of you know, those big name top tier stars. So it was really very fun to, to have that experience. Oh yeah, but I, I went dressed as bacon, like a suit of bacon. So I was, I was an automatic <laughs> hero. By the way. No way. Yeah. I mean, that's I the best. Think, I don't think anyone can top that. Like Oprah, Beyonce, any I mean, football star. I, I don't mean, think anyone. bacon wins, right? Bacon's at bacon, the top. Bacon wins. <laughs> I, want, I don't want to come in, you know, as, you know, get them excited right away. Like bacon, whether they like me or not, they like bacon. So that was. That's good. right. You don't even need to say anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could have just stood there and hold, held the book and then been. That's just, right. That's but, true. So much fun. <laughs> if you're, if you're listening right now, go read in the schools. Go, go be a part of the schools. Go read and then you'll, you'll, you'll be blown away. There's some awesome yeah. kids out there. So uh, th this has been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. So tell us what's the best place to pick up the book, connect with you, all that good stuff. Well, I have a website, www.stephkatsovi.com, and I'm active on social media, Steph Katsovi on Instagram, Steph Katsovi Lit on Facebook. And um, I'd also invite you to check out my website for the monthly blogs that I write. I am always telling funny stories from my childhood and the lessons that I've learned, so it all kind of comes full circle. And, and so I invite anyone that's interested to check that out. And Major online retailers are the best place to buy my book. If, books, if you're so inclined, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Target, just about anybody. If you go on a website, type in my name, and uh, see what you can come up with. It's always fun to see that, too. <laughs> oh, I bet. There's probably not too many of them out there. So if you're listening right now and you're a bad speller, don't worry. I'm going to link this stuff in show notes. You can just click on things. You don't have to spell things, which is good for me. I do that for me anyway, but... <laughs> so if you're listening right now, you can just click on that, go get some books, connect with Steph, and, and get some, listen, listen to a little story. You've heard just some of the stories right here. Can you imagine what's el what else is out there? you got to go tune in. That sounds great. Thank you so much. It was so fun talking with you. Oh, I had a great time. So if, you, if, if you're listening right now, please share this episode. People need to hear about these exciting books to get these kids excited about it and read. Hey, readers are leaders, right? We need more readers out there. And kids will read if you get them an exciting and interesting book. That's what I've discovered. If you get them with something exciting, they will read it. So thank you for what you're doing out there, helping the next generation become readers. I think that's super important. And like I said, if you're listening right now, please share this episode with someone that needs to hear it. And we'll see you guys next week on the Relentless Positivity Podcast.